Welcome. I'm Howard Nima. Once again, here is G. Edward Griffin. Now, world government doesn't just happen by writing some articles or books. Uh, only when people are in control of power centers of society can they bring about massive changes like this. Not scholarship, but power. It's not public opinion, but power. Power is the key, and the power centers of society are what amalgamate and give these people power over their citizens. Now, how this came about, uh, Quigley describes this. It's very interesting what he says. How did this come about? He said, through Lord Milner's influence, these men were able to win influential posts in government, in international finance, and become the dominant influence in British imperial affairs and foreign affairs up to 1939. In 1909 through 1913, they organized semi-secret groups known as roundtable groups. We're covering the same ground here again. But in the chief British dependencies and the United States, these still function in eight countries. The task was given to Lionel Curtis, who established in England and each dominion a front organization to the existing local roundtable group. This front organization, called the Royal Institute of International Affairs, had as its nucleus in each area the existing submerged roundtable group. In New York, it was known as the Council on Foreign Relations and was a front for J.P. Morgan and Company. All right. At last, we come to this ubiquitous Council on Foreign Relations. You hear more and more about it. Even increasingly now on the news, you'll say, and here is a word from so-and-so uh, from the Council on Foreign Relations Office. And the average uh, gum-chewing public says, huh, that sounds good. I wonder what that's all about. So increasingly, this phrase, CFR, Council on Foreign Relations, is becoming more and more uh, at least common. People don't know what it is, but they've heard it. So it's no longer frightening when they hear it. So we are informed by Quigley and others that the Council on Foreign Relations was spawned by a secret society which still exists today, that it is a front for a roundtable group originally embodied in J.P. Morgan and Company, but now the Rockefeller Consortium, and that its primary goal is no longer the expansion of the British Empire, but global collectivism with control in private hands, administered in a feudalist fashion by the central banks of the world. Now, ladies and gentlemen, these are their words, not mine. Now, why is this important? It is important because the members of the Council on Foreign Relations are the rulers of America. Can I back that up? I think I can. Who are the members of the Council on Foreign Relations? It's a very long list. Actually, there's about 4,000 names. And it's, it's available, by the way, if you write to the Council on Foreign Relations office on your own letterhead, especially if it's a corporate letterhead. So I'd like a copy of the annual report. You'll get it. I've been collecting these for many years. And in the back of each report, they have the list of the current members. And here's what I found. Let's start with presidents of the United States. Council members include Herbert Hoover, Dwight Eisenhower, Richard Nixon, Gerald Ford, James Carter, George Bush Sr., and William Clinton. Now, JFK once said that he was a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, but I've not been able to find his name on any of the membership lists. So there's some, he's confused over that. I guess he wanted to be, but never quite made it in. Now, um, Former presidential candidate John Kerry is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. And if anything should happen to uh, President Bush, then Richard Cheney would become president, and he is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Secretaries of State, undoubtedly, to this group are more important than presidents because the presidents often just take advice. I mean, there's so much going on. They've got their, their cabinet, and they've got people telling them what to do. And so the Secretary of State is a critical figure, a critical position in this new world order. And uh, so we're, it's not surprising to find that just about every 
Secretary of State from the beginning has been a member of the CFR. Here's the list. Dean Rusk, Robert Lansing, uh, Frank Kellogg, Henry Stimson, Cordell Hall, E.R. Statinius, George Marshall, Dean Atchison, John Foster Dulles, Christian Herter, Dean Rusk, William Rogers, Henry Kissinger, Cyrus Vance, Edmund Muskie, Alexander Haig, George Schultz, James Baker, Lawrence Egelberger, Warren Christopher, William Richardson, Madeleine Albright, Colin Powell, and of course, Condoleezza Rice. Of course, in 2008, much, um, we had a new I'm Secretary delighted of State, to be here in these Hillary new headquarters. Um, I have been often to, uh, I guess, the mothership in New York City, uh, but it's good to have an outpost of the council right here down the street from the State Department. Uh, we get a lot of advice from the council, so this will mean I won't have as far to go to uh, be told uh, what we should be doing and uh, how uh, we should uh, think about the future. Attacked us, they killed our people. But what was going on and why they were doing what they were doing? No, 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 no. Is I, I, still, I, I, is still again, again, we no. were misled that there was supposedly protests and then something sprang out of that, an assault sprang out of that. And that was easily ascertained I, that that was not the fact. But, but, and the American know, people could have known that within days, and, and they, they didn't know that. With all due respect, the fact is we had four dead Americans. Was it I because understand. of a protest or was it because of guys out for a walk one night who decided they'd go kill some Americans? What difference at this point does it make? Let's not forget Skull and Bonesman, John Kerry. Now much has been said by the Secretary of State and others about a new world order about a defining moment in history. I have no doubt about the potential of this moment to be defining in terms of history, but that definition can be negative as well as positive. And how negative or positive it will be will depend on what kind of new world order we really create. Can it truly be said that the United States of America, trading off better treatment to China for an abstention on a vote, cozying up to Syria with its record of support for terrorism, or making promises to other countries in exchange for a hold your coat, you go ahead and take the risks and casualties endorsement. Can it truly be said that these create a new world order? Can it really be said that we're building a new world order when it's almost exclusively the United States who will be fighting in the desert? Not, not alone, but almost. Displaying pride and impatience, and implementing what essentially amounts to a Pax Americana. Is that a new world order? Can it really be said that this is a true new world order when it lacks a true United Nations collective security effort with the full measure of international cooperation and burden sharing which that should carry? With the end of the Cold War, Henry Kissinger pointed out in his superb book on diplomacy. He said, Wait a minute, isn't Kissinger on the other team? The Republicans, Nixon's Kissinger, he's a Republican. How could a Democrat be praising a Republican? They're working together. Oh, isn't it so good so the sheep understand that, yes, the, the right and the left can work together for a better new world order? None of the most important countries which must build a new world order have had any experience with the multi-state system that is emerging. Never before has a new world order had to be assembled from so many different perceptions or on so global a scale. Nor has any previous order had to combine the attributes of the historic balance of power system with global democratic opinion and the exploding technology of the contemporary period. That was written in 1994 and it may be even more relevant today.